Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors that's called potential disaster. And everybody has it within their power. Well, it was so happy for me to find out at age 25, Mr. Shove said, Mr. Rohn, you don't have to change countries. But you do have to change philosophy. And if you'll change philosophy, not country, you can turn around your income, you can turn around your bank account, you can turn around your skills, you can become capable, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the other equities that you could possibly want out of your life using the only stuff there is and not trying to change any of this stuff. Appreciate all of this stuff with all of its ups and downs, with all of its mystery of why it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Don't challenge this. You don't have to ask for another planet. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. And you can start this whole process of personal life change. Philosophy. To form our philosophy, you got to think. You got to use your mind. You got to process ideas. And this whole process over a lifetime, starting way back here when we were children, schools that we've attended, our parents, our experiences, all this stuff that we've processed by the thinking process helps to develop our philosophy. And in my opinion, each person's personal philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. Here's what I called it in that last presentation when I was here. It's called the set of the sail. Each person's personal philosophy is like the set of the sail. Now, I used to think it was circumstances that ordered my life. If someone would have asked me at age 25, Mr. Rohn, how come you're not doing well? Pennies in your pocket, creditors calling, nothing in the bank, behind on your promises to your family, you live in America, 25 years old, got a beautiful family, every reason to do well, and things are not going that well for you. What is wrong here? It would not have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. I mean, it would not have occurred to me. Saying, well, I got this lousy philosophy and that's how come I got pennies in my pocket and nothing in the bank and things aren't working well. That would not have occurred to me. I found it much easier to blame the government. Much easier to blame the tax problem. I used to say taxes are too high. Top tax rate when I first started paying taxes, 91%. Back then, when your income reached a certain level, all your income over that, 91%. So I used to say that's too high. Now the tax, top tax rate's about 33%. But people are still saying what? Taxes are too. See, but you can't use that anymore. If it's gone from 91 to 33, how could it be too high? Come on. I threw all that old excuse stuff away. Some people found it though, and they're using it these days. My old list. I used to blame the traffic, the weather, used to blame circumstances, right? People say I'm too, too tall, I'm too short, I'm too old. I was raised in obscurity, raised on a farm, parents of modest means, all the stuff. If you were to ask me, how come you find yourself here, Mr. Rohn, age 25, living in America, land of abundance and opportunity, pennies, zero in the bank, not doing well, creditors calling, it would not have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. I found it easier to blame the company, company policy. I used to say, if this is all they pay, how do they expect you to do well? So I figured that, you know, my future was going to be tied to what everybody else was arranging, the economy. and. Right? Interest rates. I used to say things cost too much. That was my whole explanation, not my philosophy. Until my teacher taught me better that this is where the problem was, my own personal philosophy. Here's what's exciting about each person's personal philosophy. That's what makes us different than dogs and animals and birds and cats and spiders and alligators. That's what makes us different than all other life forms. The ability to think, the ability to use your mind, the ability to process ideas and not just operate by instinct. In the winter, I'm telling you, the goose can only fly south. What if south doesn't look too good? Tough luck. It can only fly south. But see, human beings are not like a goose, can only fly south. I mean, you can turn around, go north, you can go east, you can go west, you can order. The entire process of your own life 
And we do that by the way we think. We do that by exercising our mind. We do that by processing ideas and come up with a better philosophy, a better strategy for our life, goals for the future, okay? Plans to achieve those goals. All this comes from developing our philosophy. Philosophy helps us to process what's available. Well, when we get here, we got seed and we got soil and we got some rain and we've got some what? Sunshine and we've got some seasons and what? The miracle of life. Now the key is what do you do with all this stuff? How do you turn all this stuff that's available here into equity and promise and lifestyle and dreams and future possibilities? All of this that's possible now with human beings, how do you take all this stuff and turn it into this equities and values? Well, it starts with philosophy. What is the seed? What is the soil? What is the sunshine? What is the rain? Is it possible to take some of each of all the stuff that's available and turn it into food and turn it into value and turn it into nourishment, and turn it into something spectacular and unique that no other life form can do? And the answer is yes. But you cannot deal with all this stuff and what to do with it unless you start refining your philosophy. Think, use your mind, come up with ideas and strengthen your philosophy. So the seed and the soil and the rain and the sunshine, this is called, you know, the economy and the banks and the money and the schools and uh, everything that's available out there, processing information, what to do with all that and turn it into equity and value. That is the major challenge of life, my personal opinion. So each person's personal philosophy now is gonna determine what you're gonna do with seed and soil and sunshine and rain and miracle, the change of seasons. That's it, my personal opinion. Each person's personal philosophy is like the set of the sail. That's what this seminar is for today. Help you to trim a better sail. You don't need a better economy. You don't need better seed and soil, in fact, when it comes to seed and soil and rain and sunshine and seasons and the miracle of life, that's all you got. Now, what if you blame this stuff? Then you're blaming all you got. If you blame the economy and you blame the schools and you blame the teachers and you blame the sermons and the preachers and, and you blame, uh, you know, the marketplace and you blame the company and company policy, what else is there? When some people get through with their blame list, there isn't nothing else. That's all there is. And if you blame the only thing you've got to work with, I'm telling you, it's called mistake colossal. In not understanding that that's all you've got to work with. And if this is all you've got to work with, then you don't change the seed and you don't change the soil and you don't change the rain and you don't change the sun sign. You don't change the seasons. Right? Guy says, I'll take three springs, four summers, nine falls, no winters, no, you can't fool with this stuff. You got to take it like it comes. Then what do you change to make your life work well? You got to start with your philosophy. Guess what I had to do at age 25 in order to change my own future. I had to change my mind. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I was messed up on what was causing my problem. And once I got that straightened out, that all the stuff I blamed, the government and taxes and the marketplace and the economy and things cost too much, negative relatives, cynical neighbors. Once I got rid of that and started going for where the real problem was, which was me, I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. My bank account changed immediately. My income changed immediately. My whole life took on a whole new look and color immediately. And the early results I got from making these philosophical changes tasted so good, I've never stopped the process from that day until this. And I'm telling you, with a little consideration of the refinement of your sail, by setting a better sail, refining your philosophy, your whole life can start to change from today on. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next month. You don't have to wait till spring. You can start this whole process immediately. I recommend it. Now, some people do so little thinking, they don't even have their sail up. I mean, you can imagine where they're gonna wind up at the end of this week, at the end of this month, at the end of this year. Now's the chance to change, process all this information. So number one is philosophy. Here's the definition of success and failure. Just make this note. Here's failure. A few 
errors in judgment. Repeated every day. Now you can automatically assume, Mr. Owen, I say, I can understand that. A few errors in judgment repeated every day. For six years, I'm with my father. I think I told this story the last time I was here. My father, 88 years old, he's never been ill, still hasn't retired. Not long ago, midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. We've drilled a new well, got some extra water, got some more acres going, he's all excited. At midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. My father's eating what he calls his midnight snack. A little bite to eat before you go to bed. Don't have to go to bed hungry. And I'm watching him eat this midnight snack. Guess what he had? An apple, a few graham crackers, and a glass of grapefruit juice. I said, no wonder my father's so healthy. My mom taught us all those good health practices. Taught me when I'm growing up, right? I'm an only child, I've never been ill. Passed the big 5-0 some time ago. My two daughters, 32, 33, never been ill. My grandkids, never been ill. I'm telling you, the legacy lingers on. As I watched my father have this midnight snack, suddenly occurred to me. I know that's part of it. An apple, what? A day, that's gotten to Dallas-Fort Worth, right? An apple. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Good question for this intelligent audience. What if that's true? You say, well, Mr. Owen, if that's true, that would be easy to do, then what's the problem? It's easy not to do. It's easy not to adopt it as your own personal philosophy. Or the guy messed up the saying. Guy says, a Hershey bar a day, say, no, no. You've been watching too much television. It is not Hershey bar. You gotta be smarter in philosophy than to fall for the Hershey bar a day when it's an apple a day. You've got to be smarter than that. And if you make that kind of an error in judgment every day for six years, I'm telling you, it'll accumulate into disaster. Sometimes the first year you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now, what difference is it going to make? You've got to be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You've got to be so smart that you look down the road and say, will the errors in my present judgment of philosophy, what's that going to cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic if you'll look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. I started working when I was 19. I met my teacher who helped turn my life around when I was 25. That's six years. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promises. I live in America. I'm 25 year old American male. I got a nice family, every reason to do well. And I'm messed up. Now what's messed up? I used to think it was the community that was messed up and the country was messed up and the government was messed up. If those Democrats ever get in the White House, that'll really mess things up. If the Republicans stay in power, that'll really mess things up. The economy was messed up. Interest rates are messed up. I thought all this stuff was messed up. Then I found out that's not what was messed up. I was criticizing the only thing I had to work with. What was really messed up was my own personal philosophy. My own errors in judgment in my own personal philosophy brought me in six years to pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well, living in America, 25-year-old American male, got a family, every reason to do well. Now, once I understood this, here's the formula for failure, errors in judgment, being lax about developing your own personal philosophy, I'm telling you, it's called accumulated disaster. It doesn't matter whether it's your health or your bank account. Guy's got an empty bank account, probably has high cholesterol. Why? Over the last six years, he never paid attention to either one. And it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar, or whether it's your money, or whether it's your cholesterol count. All you got to do is commit the errors 
And just because disaster doesn't fall on you at the end of the first day that you don't eat an apple. You say, well, I didn't eat an apple today and tonight I'm not ill. Well, you got to be brighter than that. Someday you got to leave first grade. The reason we make those first grade desks so small so they won't fit at age 25. You mean, right? You don't belong here anymore. Come on. Now, let me give you the secret to success. The formula for failure, a few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month, starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happens in six years. Now, here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And you've started a whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And if you decide today to go for the apple instead of the Hershey bar, I'm telling you, you have begun the process of turning your life around. And if you keep up that process, not only with your health habits, but with your money habits and with your communication habits, with your sales habits and management habits and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors and replace it with disciplines practiced I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately. After today, you don't ever have to be the same again. Only by choice. You don't have to walk out of here the same as you walked in today. Only by choice. You can start a whole new process. And you say, well, Mr. Owen, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. Where else would you start but with an apple? You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health and you don't? What'll that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean, don't might mean you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn. And either one's called disaster. Could, should, don't. I'm telling you, that's why at the end of five years, I've Six years, I found myself with pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, creditors calling. Could, should, won't. Could, should, don't is called disaster. Now, how do you change all that? The next six years, I got rich. The next six years, I became a millionaire. By the time I'm 31, I'm a millionaire. How about that? You say, well, Mr. Rohn, what happened? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same. I'm telling you, taxes were about the same. My negative relatives were the same. I'm telling you, the economy was about the same and prices were about the same and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. Somebody says, well, what did you go to work on to do all that? I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking changing my mind, coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life. Within a six year period, I was never the same. And I've kept up that process all these years. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday. Somebody says, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. <laughs> Guess what I want people to say? I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you, the man works on his craft. I'm telling you, the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you, the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you, he's worked hard on himself. That's why he's able to deliver like he does. The same thing can happen for you as a teenager. It can happen to you as a mother, as a father, as a business person, as a salesperson, running a business. Doesn't matter. Management, wherever you find yourself, this is the process called personal change. And what I say to start with is start with your own philosophy. Everybody has a need for achievement, to do well, to get somewhere in life, to be better, to achieve. Achievement means moving forward. And in order to move forward, you must be motivated, inspired, ambitious. You must have dreams and goals that create ambition, good ambition, positive ambition. Now, ambition does not mean being greedy. It does not mean being selfish. It does not mean getting ahead at the expense of others. Ambition is not greed. 
Ambition is not avarice, an all-consuming desire for wealth. Ambition is not hoping you can win at the expense of others. Do you suppose Judas was ambitious? He ended up with 30 pieces of silver, a fortune in those days. Was Judas successful because he had all that money? No, Judas sold out. Was Judas happy when it was all over with? No, the money didn't make him happy. What he did to get the money certainly didn't make him happy. What Judas became in the pursuit of his fortune caused him to end his own life. What drove him was not ambition. Ambition is not greed. Ambition is an eager desire to achieve, an eager desire to get ahead in life, to do more for your family, to prosper in health, wealth, and relationships. Now, desire does not always translate into ambition. Desire is what you want for yourself, a bigger house, a better car, a fatter bank account, a better life. I desire to have these things. Ambition is how you get there. Desire is sometimes healthy. Desire is sometimes unhealthy. Desire might say, I want the tallest building in town. The destructive side of desire might urge you to tear all of the other buildings down. I guess that's one way to do it. You might get away with tearing down the first one and maybe the second one. But in your desire to tear them all down, sooner or later, some guy is going to be standing out in front of his building saying, I'm on to you, get out of here. And pretty soon you're no longer known as a builder. You're known as a destroyer. Now the second way to have the tallest building in town is to see it, dream it, and plan it, and put your team on it, work on it. Go through all of the steps to get there. Do it right. Have the ambition to be the owner of the tallest building in town. And go through all of the right steps to get there. If you really want it and have the skills to do it and the patience to weather all of the storms, your ambition will lead you there. Having the ambition to do what it takes to get you where you want to go is good. Ambition is creative and constructive. Ambition is an expression. It's something inside of you you want to express in a positive way. I'm sure you have dreams of accomplishing great things. Are you ambitious enough to realize these dreams? Are your dreams strong enough to pull you toward your future? Are they vivid enough to see the end result now? Are they worthy of doing until you get there? What are your reasons for creating these dreams? Reasons vary from person to person. I bet if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list. The list of reasons. Why is it so important to achieve these dreams? What are you trying to express? These reasons for accomplishing great things are different for everybody. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some people do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. And that is one of the best reasons. Once in a while I hear someone say, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. Hey, that's probably why the good Lord sees to it that he doesn't get his million, because he would just quit. Family is another reason, a motivator for doing well, some people do extremely well because of other people. And that's a powerful reason. Sometimes we will do something for someone else that we would not do for ourselves. I know a lady who was getting back on track from financial disaster. Even though she didn't have much of anything left, her primary motivator was to keep her daughter in private school. An expensive one. One of the best in the country. Although her goal was to financially surpass where she was before her economic fall, her main reason to work all of those extra hours was to give her little girl the best possible education. As you can well imagine, wanting to do something for someone else 
led her to all sorts of other accomplishments as well. How fortunate are the people who find themselves greatly affected by someone else? It's powerful. What has you getting up early, hitting it hard all day, and staying up late? What has you inspired? What are your reasons for doing well? What's at the core of your quest? What is the power behind your ambition? To a lot of people, ambition is kind of a mystery. The dictionary says it's an eager desire for distinction, power, or fame. But what does that really mean? Well, let's start with the word eager. All by itself, eager is kind of exciting. Kids are eager for their birthday parties. They expect to be the center of attention, get lots of presents, eat too much. I guess grown-ups are eager for birthdays too. Unless, of course, they're embarrassed that the number of candles on the cake outnumber their achievements. But we can be eager to see a ball game, eager to see our kids in a dance recital, eager to see an old friend, eager to shop for a new car. Eager sounds like a lot of fun. But do you ever hear people say they are eager to live a better life, eager to have a better family, eager to make a lot of money? Probably not. And that's a problem. Because how I see it, living a better life, having a better family, and making a lot of money takes an eager desire. We have the remarkable ability to get exactly what we must have. But there is a difference between wishes and desires. We've all heard people say, Oh, I wish I could just drop five pounds. I want to be a little lighter. And we've probably said it ourselves, especially after a big holiday dinner of turkey and homemade pie and every other thing we can possibly stuff ourselves with in one eight-hour period of time. And even though we may wish we could breathe a little easier in our clothing, we have to have the desire to exercise a little more and eat a little less. The I wish I could lose weight has to become, I have the eager desire to lose weight. I'm also sure you've heard people talk about wishing they had more money to pay the bills, or take a vacation, or just to take a little pressure off of life. But before their lifestyle can change, their wish needs to become a desire. If they really desired change, they wouldn't spend their evenings just watching TV and wishing they were doing something more. The backbone of an eager desire to change is discipline. True ambition is disciplined, eager desire. It's that little part within us that says, if I want to be ready for that meeting tomorrow, I need to finish preparing for it today. If I want to make sure I can pay for my kid's college education, I need to start saving today. If I want a better life tomorrow, I need to start working on it today. Ambition is a minute-by-minute, day-by-day mentality. To have the ambition to work towards a better family life, a newer car, a bigger house, a financially secure future, you have to live it every moment. If living a successful life was easy, I'm sure more people would be successful. If just being ambitious was enough, I'm sure all of the broke and perplexed people in the world wouldn't be broke and perplexed. While most people spend most of their lives struggling to earn a living, a much smaller number seem to have everything going their way. Instead of just earning a living, the smaller group is busily working at building and enjoying a fortune. Everything just seems to work out for them. And here sits the much larger group, wondering in awe on how life can be so unfair, complicated, and unjust. So what's the major difference between the little group with so much and the larger group with so little? Despite all the factors that affect our lives, like the kind of parents we have, the schools we attended, the part of the country we grew up in, None has as much potential power for doing good as the ability to dream. Dreams are a projection of the kind of life we want to lead. Dreams can drive you. 
Dreams can make you skip over obstacles. When we allow our dreams to pull us, they unleash a creative force that can overpower everything in our way. To unleash this power, though, your dreams must be well-defined. A fuzzy future has little pull power. Well-defined dreams are not fuzzy. Wishes are fuzzy. To really achieve your dreams, to really have your future plans pull you, your dreams must be vivid. If you've ever hiked a 14,000 foot peak in the Rocky Mountains, one thought has surely come to mind. How did the settlers of this country do it? How did they get from the East Coast to the West Coast? By foot. Carrying one day's supply of food and water is hard enough. Can you imagine hauling all of your worldly goods with you? Mile after mile, day after day, month after month? These people had dreams, big ones. They had ambition. They didn't focus on the hardship of getting up the mountain. In their minds, they were already on the other side. Their bodies just hadn't gotten them there yet. Despite all of their pains and struggles, births and deaths along the way, those who made it to the other side had a single vision, to reach the land of continuous sunshine and extraordinary wealth. To start over where anything was possible, where everything was possible. Their dreams were stronger than the obstacles in their way. You've got to be a dreamer. You've got to see the future finished in advance. You've got to see California while you're climbing 14,000 foot peaks. You've got to see the finish line while you're running the race. You've got to hear the cheers when you're in the middle of a monster project. And you've got to be willing to put yourself through the paces of doing the uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable. Because that's how you realize your dreams. Our great country was founded with dreams. They've always been important. Dreams are what caused thousands of people to leave their homes and families and start over in a land where anything was possible. To this day, dreams continue to bring people to our land of opportunity, to a country where you can start with little and end up with a lot, to America. Don't you sometimes wonder why so many immigrants who come to America can build a new life and a fortune while many of the people who were born here are barely surviving? They have a dream, a defined goal, ambition. Aside from the pioneers that crossed the prairies and the mountains to reach their vision of hope and future promises, there are other amazing examples of how ambition has shaped America. Take Ben Franklin, for instance. When most people think of Ben Franklin, they remember the kite and the lightning bolt and the discovery of electricity. What a lot of people may not know is that Ben Franklin was one of the first writers to address self-making. When Franklin started Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, he used the blank spaces between the crop data and the weather information to insert clever bits of moral and practical advice. I'm sure you've heard the saying, fish and company start to stink in three days. Well, that was one of hundreds of Ben Franklin's comments on life. Another was, diligence is the mother of good luck. You know, it's amazing how hard-working, smart-working people have all the luck. We sometimes hear of a brand new musical group, an overnight success. They must have been in the right place at the right time, knew the right people, had a friend to help them out. But if you've ever watched an interview with some of these folks, you'll probably hear that their overnight success took several years. Diligence is the mother of good luck. Now, in addition to these witticisms, Ben Franklin gave us three principles of success and ambition that have withstood the test of time. Number one, happiness doesn't come from big pieces of great success but from small advantages hammered out day by day. What Mr. Franklin is saying here is that we must be happy with what we've got when we're in pursuit of what we want. Too often we say, oh, I'll be happy when I just get that promotion. I'll be happy when I just land that contract. 
I'll be happy when I just have more money. I'll be happy when I just. Just what? You won't be any happier when you reach your goals than you are right now. It just doesn't work that way. Abraham Lincoln said it best. He said, you'll be as happy as you make up your mind to be. Right now, whether you're on your way, whether you've already gotten there, you'll be as happy as you make up your mind to be now. Right now. Being happy on the way doesn't mean you can't aim for great things. After all, look at everything Franklin accomplished in his lifetime. It means that big achievements come one small advantage at a time. It means that you've got to enjoy the journey. It means that you must enjoy and take pride in your little accomplishments. It means enjoying who you are becoming in pursuit of your eager desire every day, every single day. Ben Franklin's second principle said that life is plastic. Within each of us is the power to mold, mold ourselves and mold our environment. It is up to each of us to begin this molding process with a final product in mind. And it is within our power to work it and form it every minute, every day, every month, every year. By using your mind and your abilities and your attitude to work a little each day on molding your life, You'll soon see how magnificent your power is to gain those small advantages each day. The little steps it takes to build up to success. Principle number three. Success is a pleasure. Success is a pleasure. If what you are doing today isn't satisfying, gratifying, guess what? You're really not successful. If you are not fulfilled with what you are doing today, you cannot possibly be successful. It doesn't matter how many worldly possessions you may have, how many cars, how many toys, how much money. If you're not happy with your life as it is, you cannot be successful. Now, I know that success is a relative term. It means different things to different people. To a school kid, success may mean a star on top of his latest test. To a homemaker, it probably means that she has a well-run household and a wonderful family. To an outside professional, it's most likely the thrill of closing a major contract, or the pride in accepting a performance bonus, or being named the top producing salesperson. But the one thing you will hear from everyone who is successful is that they are happy with who they are and what they are doing. They are happy content, satisfied. Success is a pleasure. What have you done today that makes this day successful? Think about it and write it down. If at the end of the day you can jot down the things that have made it a good day, you will soon see patterns forming. This really is a good habit to get into. When you can see a pattern of pleasure, you'll know you're on the road to success. So take note of Mr. Franklin's three principles of success and ambition. Number one, big achievements come one small advantage at a time. One step at a time, one day at a time. Number two, you have the power to mold your life, to make it whatever you want, to shape it and reshape it. And number three, success is measured through pleasure. This is the key one. Success is measured through pleasure. You've got to be happy along the way. You've got to learn to give yourself a pat on the back. Good job, you need to tell yourself. I'm proud of me today. You've got to be happy. You've got to learn to enjoy the process. These are really common sense ideas. They're practical. And William James agreed. He's another American great one of the most notable philosophers and psychologists in our history. And he founded a philosophy called pragmatism. To be pragmatic is to be practical, to test the validity of a concept by its practical results, to actually question something and rate its usefulness by what it can do for you, to hear a method of doing something and figuring out if it's even worth your while. 
One of the issues Mr. James dealt with in his lifetime was, what does it mean to be a success, a significant person? After years of pondering this question, William James described success as a combination of two things. Number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. And number two, outer achievement related to that ideal. Let's go back to number one, an inner ideal which is followed persistently with courage. I take that to mean defining a goal and having the resolve to complete it. No matter what, I'll do it or die. Promise yourself you'll read the books until your skills change. Go to the seminars until you get a handle on it. Do it until it makes sense. Practice it until you've got it right. Don't give up until you get where you want to be, however long that is. Step by step, piece by piece, book by book, seminar by seminar, do it until. Go for it. Until is a very important word. It's magic. It means that you'll never give up. Don't miss the chance to grow, to pay the price, until you learn change, grow. You'll discover some of life's great treasures when you pay that price. William James' second part to success dealt with the outer achievement related to that ideal. You need both aspects to really be a success. But what Dr. James realized about his philosophy of success was that the first part is indeed more important than the second. Going for it. As long as you're working toward your inner goal, your dream, then success is possible. But once you give up your inner vision, then you can never become successful. You never will become successful. Until doesn't even matter. Now, maybe the person who's been working on a project for 10 years can be successful in his own right. If he's honestly working toward it, doing everything, to make himself worthy of reaching the dream. Really happy with where he is, doing it until. Then maybe he is a success. It's a personal thing. Going for it one step at a time. Going for small accomplishments along the way for however long it takes. So let's think about this for a moment. What outside evidence or results or proof can be seen when you accomplish your goals one step at a time. You'll start to see things change around you, little things, not major things, but little everyday things, things you may not even notice unless you are paying attention. If you're one of those who'd rather stay up late and get up late only to discover that your workplace doesn't fit your schedule and you roll out of bed cursing the alarm clock every morning Maybe you could start with the little change of going to bed half an hour earlier than normal. And maybe you'll see, in time of course, you can't train your body overnight. Maybe you'll find out that you jump out of bed in a better mood. And that your day will start better. And that you'll get more done. And that the people around you that caused you problems aren't so hard to work with after all. It all starts by making one little change and adding to it every day. You see, you can't change what's going on around you without first changing what's going on within you. Start changing how you look at mornings, and sure enough, people will start changing how they look at you. When you start changing how you think, how you act, how you treat others, how you treat yourself, when you start responding instead of reacting to life, life will start responding to you. I'm telling you that you can do it with your lifestyle. You can do it with your sales career. You can do it with your management career. You can do it with any part of your life. If you are looking for equities unmatched, don't curse the only thing you have. Seed and soil, sunshine and rain, miracle and seasons. But start processing things like we're covering in this program and change will take off for you. You cannot believe what can happen in such a short period of time. So you ask yourself, 
What small changes can I start making today? Well, you can start in your car on your way to work. If you're sitting on the highway, stop and go traffic, moving at about 15 miles per hour tops, look at the guy or the lady sitting next to you and give them a smile, or thumbs up, or even wave. Now, some people might think you're a little strange, but hey, you'll feel better. And tomorrow, when you get into the office, how about a big cheery hello to the people at the front desk and everyone you see on the way to your office? And when you get home tonight, how about giving your wife or husband and kids big hugs instead of collapsing on the sofa? When you start with the little things that make others happy, improve their day, you'll find that these little things add up to big ones. So what happens when you start taking charge of your own personal happiness, your own life? Do you think that these little things will somehow make a difference in meeting your goals? You bet they will. You can't do it alone. You can't be successful by yourself. It's hard to find a rich hermit, you know. The ambitious person realizes that each of us needs all of us. You all by yourself may have finalized the company's marketing plan or finished up the sales projections or even wrote the mission statement for the year to come. Even if you did this all by yourself, you really had the help of all of those around you who tolerated and supported your need to be undisturbed or provided service to you during the project. Maybe you should thank those people every once in a while with a dinner certificate or a bouquet of flowers or 18 holes of golf. Even a thank you note. Thank you notes are so important. After all, without your support team, you probably wouldn't be where you are today. You can't be successful by yourself. So thank them. Thank those around you. And let them know just how important they are to you. Be it your office personnel or your family or your friends, a thank you sure goes a long way. You don't have to worry about what other people will say. You just have to keep your mind on your course. Those winds may blow fast and furious, but if you know your path, if you know where you are going, they will help push you toward the dreams and goals and treasures that you have already decided you're going after. Your goals will push you forward ahead of the stormy weather. There are some amazing people around that we can learn from today. People who have already braved the storms and come out on top. People who are still alive today. People who started with nothing and ended up with something great. Famous people, not so famous people. Maybe even people you know, but don't know their stories. People who had an early vision and ambition people who turned their focused dreams into the reality of success. One of my friends tells this story about her dad. She thinks he's cheap. She gives him a hard time every time they go to one of those all-you-can-eat places because he eats all he can eat until he can't move, until he needs to take something for indigestion. But she knows where he came from, his history, and understands just why he is the way he is. He eats all he can eat because he was raised in an orphanage, a place where you had to grab all you could or you'd be hungry. But the real story behind her father is that he made himself a millionaire with nothing more than a dream. He watched his own father drown when he was four, was taken away from his mother a few years later and put into an orphanage because he was so bad. Raised by other people, strangers. After growing up in foster homes, he decided to go out on his own. He barely finished high school, but he found a job as a vacuum cleaner salesman. He did well, really well. But the woman he loved didn't want to marry a vacuum cleaner salesman, and he really didn't want to be one. So he went to college went on to medical school, prospered, really prospered, led a tremendously successful life as a radiologist, and is now retired, goes fishing, rides his Harley. 
Stories of success are all around us, everywhere. Take the time to talk to these people or read their stories. You might learn something. You might find out that they have already traveled the path you are now on. You know, when most of us think of Jesse Jackson, we think of the political Jesse Jackson. But what most of us don't realize is that before Jesse Jackson went to the streets to gain votes, he went to the ghettos with a message for inner city youth. During his rallies, he would have the street kids repeat after him, I am somebody. Jesse Jackson's message to these kids was that ambition is a moral imperative. To be a good person, you have to have ambition. You have to try to do something good with your life. You have to try to get out of where you are today or make where you are a better place tomorrow. You have to, or anything else is a waste. Mr. Jackson knew that his contribution to life began with America's youth, where he could make a difference before bad attitudes and bad habits took over for good. He went to make a difference with the disadvantaged youth of America. What an admirable mission. I'm sure you know that the same principles he teaches apply to you. When you get up tomorrow morning and are standing in front of the mirror getting ready for the day, remind yourself that you are somebody, that you are important, and that you can make the changes that will move you closer to your ideal future. Listening to the words of people like Jesse Jackson are of total importance because motivation, lasting motivation, is backed with education. Many of these people have written books on their journeys. These books tell the stories and give the secrets that we can all learn from. Let's say you decided to take a trip, just a short one, maybe for a weekend. Let's say you want to go away to a place you've never been before. Wouldn't you want to find someone who had been there, ask them a few questions? What's the best way to get there, the safest route? The quickest route. What do I need to bring to be totally prepared? What fun things should I look for on the way? What dangers do I need to avoid? By talking with someone who has already been there, it'll make your trip that much more enjoyable. It's the same thing with life. By listening to those who are farther along in the journey, the journey you are interested in taking, and learning from their successes and failures, you just might pick up something that will make your journey that much better. Listening to the stories of others can be motivating, captivating. They can provide that extra push you've been looking for. They can demonstrate what the power of ambition is truly all about. They've been there. Their knowledge is valuable. And when you use that knowledge and motivation to take action, you'll gain momentum. Eventually, you will find that the key to motivation, true motivation, is right there inside you. You won't have to look elsewhere to get pumped up, turned on, charged up. With the right knowledge behind you, you will learn how to motivate yourself. With the right knowledge, you will find yourself becoming inspired on your own. You could do the most incredible things if you have enough reason. See, reasons will change your whole life. Mr. Shelf said to me, he said, Mr. Owen, I think you've got plenty of intelligence, you've got plenty of talent, you've got plenty of ability. Probably what you lack is plenty of reasons. He said, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indication of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you're much smarter than your present bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. But of course, my first question was, well, then why isn't it bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reasons. You've got enough intelligence, but not enough reasons. So see, reasons can change your life. Here's what else I found out. Reasons come first, answers come second. You don't get the answers to do well till you get the reasons. Life has a mysterious way of hanging on to all the answers. 
and only gives them up to the people that are inspired by reasons. So reasons make the difference in how your life works out. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? Let's go through a quick list called reasons for doing well. First is personal reasons. Some people do well for recognition. Some people do well for respect. Some people do well for the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. Those are good reasons. I have some millionaire friends that keep working 10, 12 hours a day, making more millions. And it's not because they need the money. It's because they need the joy and the satisfaction and the pleasure that comes from being a constant winner. And see, it's not just the money anyway. It's the journey, not the money. Once in a while, somebody says to me, boy, if I had a million dollars, I'd never work another day in my life. That's probably why the good Lord sees to it they don't get their million, right? They'd quit. They'd quit. Okay. Next is family reasons. Some people do extremely well for other people. And that's powerful. Human beings can greatly affect each other. Sometimes we will do things for somebody else we will not do for ourselves. We're made that way. I met a man one time who said, Mr. Rowan, to do all the things I want to do with my family around the world, he said, I got to have at least a quarter of a million dollars a year. I thought, incredible. Could a guy's family affect him that much? And the answer is, of course. How fortunate are the people that find themselves greatly affected by somebody for personal achievement. And we are affected. The writer of a recent song said, if not for you, the winter would hold no spring, couldn't hear a robin sing. I just wouldn't have a clue if not for you. So we can be affected. That might be one of the most stimulating reasons to do well, finding somebody. When Andrew Carnegie died, the wee little Scotsman that built the big steel industry, when he died, they opened up his desk and in one of the desk drawers, they found a slip of paper. On that piece of paper, Mr. Carnegie had written his goal for his life and he wrote it when he was in his 20s. And on that piece of paper, it said, I'm going to spend the first half of my life accumulating money. I'm going to spend the last half of my life giving it all away. What a goal. He got so inspired by that goal that the first half of his life, he accumulated $450 million. And the last half of his life, he gave it all away. Good question tonight. What's got you turned on? What's got you bombed out of sight to get up early and stay up late and hit it all day? Next question. What's got you turned off? When I found the answers to those two questions, my life exploded into change. I finally found out what had me turned off and I got that cured. And then I got me a long enough list of reasons to turn me on. And once the lights went on for me, age 25, I now carry several hundred dollars in my money clip. It's only a few hundred dollars, but it was one of those reasons turned my life around. Just before I met Mr. Show, I heard a knock at the door. I go to the door and there's a little girl standing there about this tall selling Girl Scout cookies. And she gave me one of the finest sales presentations I've ever heard. Special deal several flavors, this whole package of stuff, $2. And with a big smile, she very politely asked me to buy. And I wanted to. Big problem. 
I'm broke. Let's put him into one big impossible to pay bill, right? I would get four or five payments behind. This one guy used to call me day and night. I don't think they're allowed to do that anymore. Harassed me. Threatened to run me in front of the judge. Threatened to ruin my credit. Threatened to embarrass my family. One day he said, we're gonna come get your car, drag it rear end up down the street in front of your neighbors. The guy even called me a flake. And back in those days, I'm broke, I'm pitiful. There's nothing I can do about it. But I never forgot how the guy treated me. And when I met Mr. Show and I got my life started, straightened out and the money started to flow. That was one of my first projects, budget finance. I poured it on day and night. I finally put all the money together I owed him, which was considerable. I picked a day for the payoff. And when the payoff day came, I put the money in small bills in a big briefcase. And I walked into the budget finance office on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. The guy who harassed me so often, his desk was about three back. I walked right up to his desk, startled him. He wondered what I was doing there. It was the first time I'd been there since I'd borrowed the money, right? Without saying a word, I opened up this briefcase, dumped this pile of money all over his desk. I said, count it, it's all there. I will never be back. And I turned around and stormed out. Now, that might not be noble, but if you haven't tried it, you've got to one time. It can be the day that turns your life around. All you need is a reason that turns you on. One of my dear friends, Robert DePew, Bobby used to be a school teacher in Lindsay, Olive capital of the world. Bobby taught school several years, got a little weary teaching school. One day decided he wanted to get into sales. So without telling anybody, he just up and quit his job teaching school and jumped into sales. When he did, his brother made fun of him, laughed at him, put him down, said Roberts lost his mind, had a good job teaching school. Now he thinks he's a sales. He's gonna go down the drain, lose everything. Just put him down something fierce. Bobby said, the way my brother acted when I got into sales, he said that made me so mad, I decided to get rich. And my question for you tonight is, is it possible to get that mad? Of course. Wealth is not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of inspiration. Today, Robert happens to be one of my millionaire friends. Bobby's rich. Frank Sinatra said one time, the best revenge is massive success. Hey, get you a long enough list of reasons so that after tonight you never lack for inspiration. You might not have all the answers right away, but you can get the answers if you can get the reasons. Your better future is a dream for yourself and for your family. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? You've got to dream dreams. There's a Bible phrase that says, without dreams and visions, people perish. You've got to have something to go for that inspires the heart and the soul. Dream. From the children of Sanchez, it says, take the crumbs from starving soldiers, they won't die. Take the bread from hungry children, they won't cry. But without dreams, we all will die. You've got to dream. Don't lose your dreams for yourself, for your future, for your family. The dreams of love and enterprise and travel and doing things, becoming something unique on your journey here. Don't lose your dreams. Do some dreaming.
Here's the big challenge of life. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That's the challenge. And of course, the other side of the coin reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you got. I have found in my experience that income does not far exceed personal development. Now, sometimes income takes a lucky jump, but sure enough, unless you grow out where it is, it'll usually come back where you are. Life has strange ways. If somebody hands you a million dollars, best you become a millionaire quickly. So you get to keep the money. Otherwise, sure enough, it'll disappear. Somebody once said, if you took all the money in the world, divided it up equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets. Incredible. Success is something you attract, not something you pursue. Success is looking for a good place to stay. So instead of going after it, you work on yourself, personal development. See, the major question to ask on the job is not what are you getting? The major question to ask on the job is what are you becoming? See, the big question is not what am I getting paid here? The big question is what am I becoming? here because true happiness is not contained in what you get happiness is contained in what you become